Welcome back, 411 fam, and to all those who are new to this channel and content, welcome. I hope that you will take the time today to watch this content, and if you like it, go ahead and click that subscribe button and you know that bell icon to be notified when I put up new content. I put up con new content on this channel five days a week. So today, we're talking about Brian Laundry again. And thank you for joining me. Laundry. The rumor mill has been in overdrive on this case you know, since it began. But what do we know about the search for Brian Laundry as of the 1st of October? Well, we know the following things for sure. Once he arrived back in Florida to his family home, with the Brian had gone on at least one, possibly two, the second trip is actually not confirmed, that he went on a camping trip for a day and a half, almost two days, with his parents. We also know that Brian Laundrie, along with an older lady, um, according to the statement from the actual AT&T store, went to an AT&T store and purchased a new, a secondary cell phone. And the FBI is very much aware of this and has been, but it just finally came out this past week after a couple of statements were released by a former AT&T employee of that store who went on record to say on, on Reddit and a couple other uh, sites that Brian Laundrie had come into the store and purchased a second new phone. But the, the attorney for the Laundrie family says, no, this cell phone was actually left behind along with his wallet and other personal items at the home when he went hiking that day. Now, this may sound uh, a little, you know, peculiar. Uh, I don't know of a lot of people who do go hiking and leave everything like a cell phone and their wallet and everything behind, uh, especially in case of an emergency. How was he planning to actually contact anybody out there? Hey, I've fallen and I've hurt my ankle. I can't hike back out. I need rescue. How was he going to do that if he, well, doesn't have a cell phone. Well, I guess he wasn't, was he? He was either planning on going into that reserve and not coming back out the Carlton Reserve, or, or he never actually went into that reserve. So that's what we know right now. We also know that at this point right now, uh, Dog the Bounty Hunter has been you know, trampling through the woods and, uh, you know, identifying what he believes is a campsite for Brian Laundry. The only evidence at the campsite that he believes was Brian Laundry's was uh, some matted down tall grass and an empty monster energy drink. Now, he has not had that can tested. As a matter of fact, if you watch the actual video, that he has online, he manhandles the entire can, putting his hands all over it, carrying, holding it this way, and then holding it with his hand over the top. So if there were, were fingerprints on there from Brian Laundry, he contaminated that entire piece of evidence. Now, they could still test it for possible DNA traces from the, you know, the lip of that, the can, but you know, you definitely would be easier to get fingerprints off it to you know, compare well, that's Dog the Bounty Hunter for you. He contaminated that piece of you know, evidence, if it even is uh, potential evidence. But the, um, to me and to laymen, you know, people who are out there who are avid hunters, that lay down area where the grass is matted down by that tree, it looks like a spot that a deer would lay down in or an elk or you know, a larger animal like that and not necessarily a matted down area that a human would make. Uh, so, you know, is it a, you know, a possible clue? Well, Dog the Bounty Hunter believes so, and people believe Dog the Bounty Hunter knows how to actually track people in the wilderness. 
Uh, I do question his um, expertise in that area. We do know he is able to find people who are hiding in plain sight in um, on a small island or a large island in, you know, being Hawaii. So th he definitely has experience there. But uh, let's see. Uh, what else do we know about the Brian Laundry case at this point? We know that according to every single law enforcement agency and the FBI, the parents have been 100% cooperative to this point. There has been no news media releases at all uh, from the law enforcement, you know, state police, local police department, sheriff's department, search rescue team, FBI, nothing from them that says that the Laundry family has not been 100% cooperative. And I'll give you an example that you can do yourself a, a Google search of. Every single time the police have wanted to search their home, they've let them in without a warrant to search their home. Every time the FBI has wanted to speak with them, they've come and spoke with the FBI or let them into the home. Every time they, the police department has wanted to come in and search the home and look for evidence and, get, and take electronic devices, they've let them, again, without a warrant, every single time. They have let them tow their cars away and his car away to be searched and have the GPS data downloaded from the, you know, each vehicle without you know, a warrant at all. And, but yet the mainstream media out there uh, keeps on saying that the laundry family is not being cooperative because they're not out there searching and beating down the brush looking for their adult missing son. Let's put yourself in their situation just for a second. And let's say that you are in your twilight you know, years of your life, like the Laundry family are, and that your son has done this, committed this horrific crime, supposedly. You know, he is innocent until proven guilty. But let's say that he, you are in that, in that position. They are basically being held captive in their own home. The media circus outside of their door is there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and has been since this case actually broke and they they actually you know determined that Brian Laundry was home and had walked into you know or gone into the actual Carlton Reserve. Now the, the it's not just a media circus. We have people who are walking up and down the street in front of their home with bullhorns yelling at them at all manners of the day and night. You know, that telling the you know the laundry family to give up Brian. To, you know, and do you know and they've been screaming disgusting things at every single delivery driver and every single person who comes to their home. To go outside to mow their lawn. They have to listen to people on a bullhorn, you know, um, it, it's kind of like, you know, a, a megaphone, you know, so in case you know what a bullhorn is, they're the same thing, but a megaphone, bullhorn, at them every time they come in and out of their home. Uh, delivery drivers, again, like I was saying, you know, are harassed every time they, they come to the home to deliver, you know, Uber Eats or anything at all. They can't leave their home. Because the moment they get in their, their truck and drive somewhere, they have somebody sticking a camera in their face and are followed everywhere they go. They can't go into their backyard because people are putting cameras over the, the wooden fence into their backyard to record them. They're trespassing on their neighbor's property or on their property. So much so, this past week, a uh, two of these protesters... Um, who were uh, trespassing on the neighbor's yard um, were confronted by a neighbor and the neighbor was actually arrested when he you know confronted one of these protesters and said stay off my lawn stay out of my yard uh, and because this neighbor had been worried about people urinating next to the, you know, the side of his garage and on his actual house because there are no facilities there for people to use, um, you know, who have been camped out there. 
these lawn chairs are, are set up across the street and are being rented out by neighbors. The one neighbor directly across the street is selling bottled water at $4 a pop, but he has been making doing a pretty brisk business selling bottled water to people who are camped out directly across the street from the, the laundry's home. Great neighborhood, huh? Now, I'm not saying that the, you know, that the mother and the father haven't, you know, possibly made some missteps, you know, and maybe aided in Brian Laundrie's disappearance. You know, and that's hard to actually say that they did or didn't. We know right now the police have not charged them or the FBI have not charged them with any crime. But at this time, still, at this point, they're prisoners in their own home. How are they supposed to go out and help find their son? If they were to go out to try to hand out flyers or look in an area for Brian Laundry, how would they do that with the media circus that would be following them everywhere they, they went? Put yourself in that situation and think about it from their perspective for a moment. And on top of it all, the local police department there and had told them, you know, it's probably best that you, you, you know, you don't go out you know, at as, as much as you can, you know, at, just stay home because they're going to follow you everywhere and it's going to cause more of an issue for us, for the police department to be able to control, you know, the 15, 20 news trucks that would be following you in every, you know, aspect of everything that you do. So, but where do we? Where is the search for Brian Laundry? Well, the new tips that have been coming in to Dog the Bounty Hunters website and tip line are that Brian Laundry may be in North Carolina, might be camping out or hiking the Appalachian Trail, and other tips have come in as far away as Canada, Mexico, the Bahamas, Belize. And yes, there have even been tips been called into the Dog the Bounty Hunter and the FBI's tip line for people who meet, uh, you know, who look like Brian Laundrie, who is far away as Washington State, all the way across the United States, and Oregon, California, and even in Great Britain. Yes, everywhere that a bald man may be walking or hiking or hitchhiking, Somebody has called that bald person in for a possible, that's Brian Laundry. We don't know where he is right now. But, you know, again, if you've seen my shorts this past week on this case, Brian Laundry, the, the, there's no way he carried enough provisions in his backpack to survive more than a week in the Carlton Reserve. There not enough fresh water you know, sources in the Carlton Reserve for him to even survive more than a week, week and a half. You can go without food, but you can't go without water. And even if he was to set up some kind of poncho rain collection thing, it would be filled full of bugs in the matter of minutes as soon as the rain was to stop. So collecting rainwater and without having the actual experience and knowledge of you know sur you know survival off the grid which he has zero of it, it would be hard for him to survive it, it doesn't lend itself to survival for a human being the Carlton Reserve the insects biting insects are, are the, one of the worst things that would just drive you absolutely nuts and he would not be able to have enough, you know, spray or repellent to keep the bugs away. There are at least five different species of deadly snakes in the Carlton Reserve. There's panthers, there's black bear, there's crocodiles that will eat him alive, and there are wild boar, and the, just to name a few of the different species of wild animals in the Carlton Reserve that he would have to watch out for. And where would he actually be able to hide? Most of the Carlton Reserve is a swampy wetland. And trying to stay you know, dry would be his number two thing after survival and lack of water and food. 
how do you stay dry in that area? There are little pockets here and there of dry land and with swamp and actual you know, uh, pretty deep parts, uh, sections of, uh, of the Carlton Reserve that, of water that you know he would have to swim through and the crocodiles would get you. And even local farmers who have ranch land around the Carlton Reserve have said that they would never want to spend a night in there because it would drive you absolutely insane and you could not find any place to lay down to survive and be dry. So if he's in there, he's most likely deceased. And you know the wild animals would have gotten to him by now. But if he is anywhere near a surface at all, we would have seen buzzards by now, you know, hovering in the sky. And there have been nothing that has been picked up on any of the trail cams or anything at all from the observation towers, nothing that says that there are you know um, vultures you know circling you know a dead carcass anywhere. So the chances are he never went into that actual reserve. He parked his car there and then walked out the opposite direction. Where did he go? I don't know. But he's definitely got a head start on the authorities you know, who are looking for him. But that's where we are as of October 1st. That is the truth about Brian Laundrie, his parents, and where this case is as of right now. Sure, there's a lot of speculation out there, a lot of rumors, and a lot of people who are just making up things so you will tune in tomorrow or today for their next live stream or their next video content. Think for yourself and wonder if somebody's talking to you about this case and giving you new information that you've never heard before, where is their source? If they're not willing to give you the source of the information, they're, they're being dishonest. And that's, a, that's just the way it is. But thank you for joining me today. You have a wonderful weekend ahead.